All right, it's a minute after the hour, so we'll probably get started. Um, just I want to mention one thing quickly that this is being recorded. It was automatically started re recording uh, after I uh, started the Zoom. So just let us let us know if you have any concern about being recorded. Okay. So with that, I want to um, start um, by thanking you all for joining from all over the world. Hopefully, this is useful. Uh, so this is being hosted by the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee under the GRSS umbrella of the uh, IEEE. So if you're not familiar with the Earth Science Informatics uh, Technical Committee, uh, it is a group, a community volunteer group that is uh, being established as one of the nine or 10 TCs. Uh, and, and this community usually brings in experts uh, on data science and data informatics to talk about state of the art, some challenges, and 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 uh, and basically networking uh, so that we all uh, can leverage each other's work. So with that, I think today's talk is uh, on Veda, which is a NASA pro uh, project, uh, which is being led by Mr. Brian Freitag, who's Dr. Brian Freitag, who's going to uh, moderate this call or web webinar. Um, we they're trying to make this as hands on as possible, so. I'm expecting there will be some hiccups, regardless of how prepared you are. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, so with that, I think uh, I just want to hand it to Brian. Brian, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Let me see if I can start my video. OK. Yeah, so thanks, Manil. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Brian Freitag. I am leading the data project here uh, at a NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, today, we're going to give you a presentation led by Amy Barchowskis. Uh, Amy is a, uh, sorry, <laughs> Amy uh, is a data engineer at Development Seed. She works uh, with NASA Impact to make Earth observation uh, data cloud friendly. Her contributions uh, to the multi-mission and algorithm and analysis platform or the MAP project um, and the visualization exploration and data analysis project have helped revolutionize the ways data can be accessed and analyzed. Amy is also a member of the steering committee for the Pangeo project and chairs the Earth Systems Information Partners Cloud Computing Cluster. Amy cares deeply about using data, data science and machine learning to drive positive social change she was named one of the geospatial world 50 rising stars in 2021 and often speaks on the topics of cloud computing, cloud optimized data, and open science. When not coding, Amy enjoys podcasts, rock climbing, biking, and running. Amy received an uh, MS in data science from Barcelona Graduate School of Economics and a BA in economics and philosophy from Boston College. Uh, in terms of the webinar format, uh, I will be moderating the, moderating the discussion. Uh, we have Jerrica Christman, uh, who's going to be helping to monitor the chat if there are questions. Um, and Amy has let us know that she prefers to kind of be interrupted. So I would consider this to be somewhat of an informal uh, webinar. If you have questions in line, please feel free to ask them. Uh, I think we do plan on making this somewhat of a hands-on uh, webinar. So uh, we've asked people, I think, for their GitHub handles. Uh, via email, uh, or I guess just if you're interested in access to the hub, we asked you uh, to kind of advise us in advance. We've been addressing them and sending those requests to your email addresses. Uh, if you have not received access and you do want it, please post your GitHub handle in the chat and I'll start working on that uh, as soon as we can. All right, with that, I'll pass it over to Amy. Awesome, you guys can see my screen now? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks, Brian, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be presenting VEDA today, which is NASA's, NASA's Earth Science Division's um, contribution to the Open Source Science Initiative of NASA. So um, before I dive into the demos and presentation, I wanted to share these links with y'all. Um, so if you take nothing else away from this presentation, you have a link to the slides, a link to the dashboard, and a link to the documentation. So before we dive into the agenda, I wanted to get started with um, some interactive components. So uh, if you haven't already requested um, 
access to the Jupyter Hub, you can send an email with your GitHub handle now to veda at uah.edu. If you've already um, sent an email, if you've already gotten an email, um, or sorry, if you've already sent an email requesting access and you haven't seen anything come through for your GitHub handle, please send your GitHub handle again to this. Um, previously, I think some invites were sent to email addresses and not Git GitHub in emails, uh, sorry, GitHub handles. Um, so again, if you need access for the first time or need to request access, please send those um, GitHub handles to this email. And Brian and um, some folks in the background will begin adding you to that Jupyter Hub instance. So yeah, join us so that you can participate. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, before we go into all the demos and everything, I wanted to say a huge thanks and shout out to this team. There's um, a lot you'll see today, a lot of really cool components of this project, and um, none of it would have been possible without a really amazing team. A lot of these people have, um, all the people on this slide have dedicated a lot of their time in the past two years to making this reality and a lot of passion. So huge thanks to all of these folks. Uh, so VEDA is the most recent um, and one of the largest in scope um, initiatives of the in IMPACT team. So IMPACT supports the Chief Science Data Office and the Earth Science Data Systems Program in three areas, interagency implementation and partnerships, assessment and evaluation, and events concepts. And uh, you can go to this link here to learn more about IMPACT. And I've just um, taken a screenshot from that page where it highlights some of the um, innovative projects that we have worked on um, as part of IMPACT. Okay, cool. So we're going to get started with some audience participation. So we want to know from you, um, why are you interested in beta and what role do you fill? So I'm going to give everybody a moment to open this link. So it's tinyurl.com slash beta dash Slido. And I'm going to go ahead and open the results. And as soon as you open it up, you should see uh, a multi multi choice select. So if anybody's having any issues, let me uh, go back to this. Nice, cool. And make sure to click submit. All right, sweet. So now we're starting to see some results come in. And I need to move this to see. So we have 13 participants so far. Most people interested in how beta can help in science objectives, what data is available and how to access it is number two. So try and cover that. Cool, and I'll give another minute to let people open this up and submit. Nice, now we have two competing ones, science objectives and what data is available. Okay, um, awesome. So now we're gonna go to the next poll. So stay on that page. You should see new multiple choice selection. So what role best describes you? Communicator, educator, advanced researcher, program scientist. Now I lost track. Okay, there we go, cool. So we have some people, data scientists, engineers, developers, awesome. Seems like things might be stabilizing. All right, we have a majority engineer developer, but we have a pretty good mix here. It looks like we're pretty evenly distributed against some of these, although you are able to select more than one. So um, some people might identify as more than one of these roles. Excellent, all right, thanks for that. Um, so now we're going to go back into our slide deck and we're going to talk through the agenda. And again, here are those links. I think that they've been posted in 
the um, links have also been pasted in the chat. So if you just want to go ahead and click on those links, that works too, of course. Um, so like I said, interrupt me at any time for questions. You can raise your hand. You can use the Zoom raise your hand option or um, put your questions in the chat and I'll try and address them as they come up. So uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of live demos today um, talking about how VEDA supports science uh, science storytelling, um, so how the dashboard supports science storytelling, and then how you can use that to uh, dive into analysis and create your own science stories. So we're going to be walking through one of the dashboard discoveries um, to understand coastal risk better, and then we're going to be able to dive in and explore the data and the analysis itself um, by basically exploring data via the analysis page and exploring the analysis by launching the Jupyter Hub from a story and seeing a notebook. And then we're gonna switch roles and enact our role as a scientist and talk about uh, FIRE. So we're gonna talk about this success story of how the VEDA team collaborated with the scientists at the um, Earth Information uh, System uh, team at Goddard at NASA and how these two teams work together to scale uh, an innovative model for fire tracking. And we're gonna showcase how basically we want to make all the science that you see on the VEDA dashboard reproducible and shareable. So we're gonna show how to contribute to documentation via GitHub, uh, a beta feature of how to create and use custom Jupyter Hub environments, and how to create a data set using Markdown for the dashboard. Um, and these two little check marks sort of indicate where you can sort of contribute to um, contribute to the dashboard, contribute to the doc to the documentation uh, through GitHub pull requests. And then we're going to go into a section about how it works. Uh, so that's gonna be all the architecture components. So if that's what's most interesting you, to you, stay tuned, um, we will get there. However, if there's any question that you have about the architecture during the demo section, please feel free to um, put those in the chat as well and we'll try and address them. And then we're going to talk about how you guys can get involved, so how GRSS can use it, so the reusable components using the Jupyter Hub and joining our open source community. Okay, so overview of VEDA. So VEDA supports the science life cycle, so sort of like I talked about earlier, it's this virtuous life cycle where you can go to the dashboard, you can explore discoveries, you can explore data sets, and then you can dive into your own analysis and you can develop your own analysis, your own data products, your own stories, and then you can contribute those back. So like I mentioned, uh, VEDA is NASA's Earth Science Division's contribution to the Open Source Science Initiative at NASA. And there's four pillars. Um, they're described here in a slightly more detail, policy and governance, core data and computing services, open science incentives, such as grants and prizes, and community engagement. VEDA puts these initiatives into practice. NASA has always had open data policies, and VEDA is moving NASA forward in its open science policies. VEDA attempts to make NASA's Earth science data mean more. Data has always been openly accessible for anyone to use, but NASA hasn't always exposed it in friendly interfaces or analytics platforms. This presentation is part of our community engagement piece. We really want to know from you and, uh, and expand the scale of the, expand the impact of this project. All right, so now we're going to dive into some demos. We're going to start with exploring the story of coastal risk in the dashboard. So this is the story I'm going to be exploring. If you want to follow along, you can navigate to earthdata.nasa.gov slash dashboard, and then you can scroll down and select the unraveling the components of coastal risk story. So this story was generated by the Earth Data Information uh, System team at Goddard, and it talks about how um, Basically, different components can impact coastal risk. So changes in the water cycle can impact coastal risk, changes to the landscape, and changes to sea level. And they talk about a metric called terrestrial water storage, which corresponds to integrated changes in surface water, rivers, lakes, wetlands, soil moisture, and basically how they've created a novel metric called the, or a novel metric of non-stationarity to identify hotspots where uh, terrestrial water storage is, um, you know, ex, uh, terrestrial water storage is uh, demonstrating non-stationarity, um, which puts the coast at risk in this in this sense. So, 
Bangladesh is one of the places that was identified as a hotspot region for having non-stationary terrestrial water storage and it being depleted at a rate of almost 13 millimeters per year. Oh, so first of all, I just wanted to share like the reason why we're walking through this story is because I think it really demonstrates how the dashboard puts interactive data alongside text. And one thing I'll dive into more in the architecture section is about how this is all um, configurable. So all these stories are not hard coded into the UI, uh, the UI components. It's all configurable. The UI, UI components itself are sort of data and content agnostic. And so we're able to pair our data catalog and the content generated by the scientists in markdown files with these UI components. And I'll talk more about that later on as well. So they've identified how um, terrestrial water storage has been depleted and identified also how ground measurements show the impacts, how part of the reason why this is happening is because of heavy pumping for groundwater, um, for irrigation on groundwater. And they've integrated another data set from MODIS to um, talk about uh, MODIS is basically being used here to identify um, land cover, land cover uh, types. So you can see here at the bottom, there's um, native vegetation and dark green and cropland and bright green. And this shows how basically one of the issues, um, one of the issues driving this non-stationarity in coastal risk, uh, this non-stationarity in terrestrial water storage is basically that we have um, more uh, cropland creeping in on the native veg vegetation. So this um, compare tool is paired alongside the narrative. So you can sort of see how the dark green areas are disappearing over time between 2001 and 2020 and those dark green areas being that native vegetation. Uh, we also, um, they also incorporated the consideration of changing sea level. So one of NASA's um, large scale models is the estimating the circulation and climate of the ocean or ECHO model, which is used to identify um, variables such as sea surface height change. And here they've basically used, um, used that model's output to identify that sea level rise is happening. It's happening along the coast of Bangladesh. And you can see that here in this total change um, of sea surface height. And then and then they've identified how that specifically is a result of changes to very, very static, what's called very static, extra water mass added to the ocean. Um, meaning, so this basically indicates that sea level rise off the coast of Bangladesh is driven by extra water mass added to the ocean from ice sheets, glaciers, and changes to land water storage. Um, so the other important thing that I wanted um, to share about the dashboard again is like how we're trying to integrate, um, we're trying to integrate reproducibility into all the discover discoveries that are here. So pairing the discoveries, the science stories with notebooks to reproduce some of the, that analysis is what we want to demonstrate here. So if you're following along, um, you can go ahead, if you're following along and you have a Jupyter Hub account, you can click this interactive notebook and that's going to spin up um, your spin up your notebook instant, your Jupyter Hub instance, your Jupyter Hub server, and it's going to open this Echo, um, this Echo uh, notebook, which we'll talk about in a second to reproduce some of the analysis that we saw. Um, if you don't have access yet, you can also explore this analysis in the static notebook. But yeah, essentially the way that this works is this is the notebook um, which connects to Podak data, the sea surface height temperature, the sea surface height data coming from Podak um, and the echo model. So you can go ahead and run through this, and um, it's going to find all the data for it's going to find all of the files for this particular um, lat long location, which is in the Bay of Bengal, which is off the coast of Bangladesh. And it's going to load in the sur sea surface height um, data. And then it's going to, I'm just gonna start some of these. Um, once it downloads those files, it's going to create, uh, it's going to create a, a data frame for 
those um, for those data sets, and then it's going to reproduce the plot that we saw in the dashboard. So while this is running, I'm going to demonstrate a few other features um, relating to how you can sort of explore this story more through the dashboard. So if you go back to that, the dashboard, you'll see that there is an analysis tab. And so while I'm waiting for my analysis to run or while I'm waiting for my permission to be granted to the dashboard, I can use this, anybody can, go and perform some analysis in the dashboard itself through this page. So I've gone ahead and I've created a bounding box around Bangladesh, and I'm going to select a date range of, um, of relevance to this story. So I'm gonna select, um, I'm gonna select 2002 to 2007. And then I'm going to see a few different data sets that are available for this um, temporal range and spatial extent. And I'm going to select terrestrial water storage because that is what we were just learning about. And um, it's going to tell me it's in the process of loading all the data. So it's loading data from cloud optimized geotiffs on S3 and um, you know, sort of subsetting them by that temporal, that temporal and spatial extent that I identified. And so while that's loading, let's go see if this is completed. Cool. So this is completed running. So I was able to reproduce that plot of sea surface height. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share here was um, there, you know, while you're sort of waiting for this plot to be generated, you can also do something like explore, um, explore more about the data. So this page talks all about the land information system, um, the land information modeling framework, and how it generates lots of different environmental indicators. Um, terrestrial water storage is just one of them. And it also gives you a link to explore the data. So, um, you know, finally, we've gotten to this cool map interface where you can explore all these things. Uh, over time, we have different, you know, you can uh, look through time at different time steps, um, terrestrial water storage, as well as these other variables that are produced by the land information system. And then if I go back to my analysis, I can see that my plot has generated. I can download an image. Another thing that I can do is um, select down. I usually like to just look at the median so that you can sort of see a downward trend. Um, if I'd selected the entire temporal range, you would have seen that downward trend more dramatically. All right, cool. I think that is most of what I wanted to demo about the dashboard. Um, so yeah, so now it's your turn. Go to earthdata.nasa.gov. And if you have access to the Jupyter Hub, you should be able to go to this page and click Analyze Data. So this is basically demonstrating that you can um, launch launch a notebook to explore more about one of the data sets, um, in this case, nitrogen dioxide. So that's the little exercise. Um, also, you can just go, at, go ahead and go to the dashboard and explore a different discovery or data set. Cool, all right, so um, now it's time for questions. Take a little break from, from the demo portion. So if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I have one question from Rachel Connolly. What kinds of analysis are your audiences doing the most? Is Brian, is, oh, okay. Uh, Brian, do you, Brian or Manil, do you have thoughts on the best way? I would say most of our analysis is coming from the Earth Data Information System science team at this point. Um, so it's pretty deep scientific analysis into um, fire tracking or fire weather modeling, fire tracking, um, fresh water, like the coastal risk story, like we just uh, demonstrated and also um, sea level rise. All right, and Ben, do you wanna, I see your hand up. Do you wanna just um, speak? Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, I was just, uh, uh, this is really interesting. I was just, uh, wondering about the uh, analysis algorithm. So it looked like you're showing a few of those. Uh, I was wondering, do those run uh, server side as part of the, the dashboard or, uh, or those running in the Jupyter notebook so that you use the uh, open interfaces to pull data down to your notebook and run the analyses there? The time series plots on the dashboard? Uh, yeah, the various ones you were showing. Yeah, I believe those are using an API to generate statistics, and those statistics statistics are being pulled into a time series plot. Um, yeah. Okay. Does and that answer your question? So it's mostly yeah. server side. Okay, so there's some some that run server side, and can you give us a sense of of what kinds of um, algorithms are available on the server side? Is, uh, just, uh, time series yeah. plots, or are there are other a broader set of algorithms. Um, yeah, good question. Right now, it's those time series plots of the different statistics. Um, maybe, Brian, if you can speak, can you speak to any um, additional uh, analysis capabilities in the dashboard we're thinking, considering bringing in, like histograms or anything like that? Yeah, I think that we were looking at general statistical, like visualizations. Histograms are one of them, um, pie charts. Um, and within the dashboard itself, within the analytics page, or sorry, the analysis page, I think it's mostly those three. Um, and Ben, what would you be interested in seeing, do you think? Well, I was just kind of wondering in the, the, the range of things. I know some, some, some analyses get more complicated, right? So you're running to one, run more, uh, complicated algorithms. Sometimes, uh, people have their own, own, uh, own algorithms that they they want to be able to use with this. So I'm guessing those would be supported uh, more through the Jupyter Notebook side. So you'd use the open yep. APIs to access the data. And then if you've got your own algorithms, you would run them, run them there. Yep. Um, I'll say two uh, things about this, but I'll also let Manel answer, which is um, we do have um, the, we, we've worked with the EIS Fire team in order to run their custom algorithms on the map data processing system, which I'll talk more about. Um, so that's an offline batch processing system. Um, and we also have a beta thing called the Open Science Gateway, which is um, looking into how to run things like the echo models um, via, you know, part of the beta platform. Um, ah, okay. And Nell, did you want to add something to that? No, well, that's exactly what I was going to say. There are multiple types of uh, analysis. These are what Amy just showed is what's possible on the browser but she's going to get into more detailed custom analysis that are supported using the open source map DPS system. That is one of the processing options that we have. Okay, great. Um, Salguna, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, asked, can we use this data for research publication? Um, I would also like to hear from Brian Minow what they think about this question, but I do believe we're working on an integration with Zenodo, which will help support publication. That's correct. Cool. Um, Frank asks, are there restrictions on how much data can be pulled analyzed at one time? Um, in the analysis uh, interface, as far as I'm aware, no, you might just have to wait a while. If you put a large spatial and temporal, a, a large temporal extent, you know, it might take a while to run, but at the moment, I don't think there's any limitations. Um, how frequent the data availability will be provided uh, to students and researcher? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Salguna, if you're on the line, do you want to speak up? Hi, um, so I'm Dr. Salguna. Uh, so my that? question is, like, yeah. uh, my name is Dr. Salguna. So my okay. question is, um, how frequently we can get the data? What is the spatial temporal difference between each data? Oh, um, yeah. So uh, that's a good question. Um, the data, all the data is in a stack catalog um, and that stack catalog, each collection will identify the spatial and temporal aspects of it. Um, so let me bring up actually, well, since we're talking about it. Um, so this is the API. Um, so it's you know obviously not as user-friendly as the dashboard, but if you go here, you'd be able to see like, what is the, um, 
temporal extent and the spatial extent of each collection. Um, so that data is available through our API. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, this is one part of the question, but how, like, um, is it 18 days visit or 16 days visit or monthly visit? Mm. Every yeah, um, the data set I just showed, I believe is a daily data set, um, mm -hmm. but depending on the data set, it's gonna be different. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so Ryan asked, can I load my own geotic data or am I restricted to it? So for the VEDA platform, as I've just shown it, um, it's just with the VEDA curated data sets. Um, we, all of the code is open source and like we'll talk about in the future, like you should be able to sort of generate your own stack catalog of data and your own VEDA dashboard um, through the open source repositories. Hi, I am from uh, India, Arun. Mm -hmm. May I have a question? Sure. I think uh, it's a uh, it's a type of multispectral data, right? Multispectral data, did you say? Yeah. Um, I don't think we have any multispectral data at the moment. No. Okay. So it's not a type of uh, hyperspectral data, right? It's a spatial temporal data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did get did I get any type of soil data type uh, data regarding this? Sorry, could you ask it one more time? Soil data. I think you are. Uh, oh, soil like, moisture data. Yeah. yeah. Um, I believe we do have soil moisture data in there. I haven't explored it myself though. Does anybody else from the Veda team? More I think uh, Amy, it will be helpful to uh, provide the link to the stack catalog browser. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. will help people understand what we already have. I do want to clarify that uh, all the data that are a part of the VEDA right now are driven by science use cases. Uh, right. So it's highly curated uh, data set, set of data sets, authoritative data sets, right? Um, okay. But if you want to bring your own data sets and so on, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll provide you that information at the end. Okay. I think we okay. do Thank need you. to move on <laughs> to there are yeah. a lot of questions. Uh, I think... So uh, I just wanted to address show... the remaining questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. So if there's more questions about the data, I think this will be helpful. Like you suggested, Manil, like if you go to nasaimpact.github.io slash beta docs, which is the docs website, and you go to APIs, you would be able to go to um, the stack browser, and this will show you all of the data sets, um, and you can explore those more. Cool, all right. So I'm gonna move on to talking about data analysis. So uh, as an earth scientist, this is our sort of user story. I want to discover and communicate how environmental change is impacting our planet. So the point that I wanted to drive home here is that VEDA is not just a storytelling dashboard, it's an open science platform. And this means that things can happen like the VEDA team worked with the EIS fire team to automate and scale the fire event data suite or FEDS fire perimeter tracking to near real time and for all of the continental United States. So if you wanna learn more about this algorithm, there is a nature article describing it in detail. I've just taken one sentence from the abstract talking about how it's a novel object-based system for tracking the progression of individual fires using VIRS, active fire detections. And I just pulled one image that helps um, digest what this means. So basically, at time T, you can see there's these um, new active, or sorry, these active fire pixels, and those are used to identify the uh, fire perimeter where the fire is growing. And then at time T plus one, you can see the new, the new active fire pixels have been identified in red, um, which helps determine how the fire is spreading, um, as well as how it might spread to a new fire identified by fire three. So VEDA supported the scaling of EIS fire tracking ability to near real time. So they had the team, the team had an algorithm um, that they were running sort of more or less manually um, or with a lot of manual setup um, to track fire events in California. And so they wanted to automate this. They wanted to sort of operationalize it to run routinely in near real time and expand the spatial domain to cover the continental United States. So the VEDA analytics platform team supported the scaling by using the multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform or MAP and its data processing system. So the VEDA analytics team created CronTab schedulers to schedule MAP DPS jobs for every four hours and to produce outputs for all of CONUS. 
and the output is sent to the beta features API, which I will demonstrate um, how to use that beta features API um, through the rest of this section of the of the presentation. And wanted to shout out Greg Cordini, Alex Mandel, and Julia Signal for supporting this effort. So today they are routinely producing fire perimeters in near real time. So what is the impact of this ability to scale? So now the Fed's data can be routinely accessed again in near real time through an Air API. This enables the EIS fire team to share data with external organizations such as FEMA. It may be added to firms as an experimental product. The team is now working with FEMA, USGS, and Forest Service to develop value-added products such as fire direction, speed of fire spread, and fire severity metrics. The science impacts of this is a better understanding of factors which contribute to fire intensity and air pollution. And this is um, from Melanie Fouillette Cook, who presented on this um, a few months ago. So cross-functional expertise was critical, and I have a few more quotes from Melanie. We would not have been able to do this without VEDA and its team, and this would not have been possible without research scientists across disciplines, data systems, and cyber infrastructure experts. And I do this not just to, um, you know, sort of applaud the team, which de de deserves applause, of course, but also because it really um, highlights how this was a uh, open science requires a cross-functional interdisciplinary team. So uh, as we work towards making these systems more operational through documentation and examples of how to use these platforms, it's still very much necessary that we work together as a team. And I'm hopeful that as we move forward in the future, um, it becomes more of a sort of, more sort of the norm for these cross-functional teams to work together to develop, to deliver on these science objectives. So this could be you too. So we also want to work with you on your science objectives. Okay, cool. So now we're going to talk about how scientists can contribute documentation about their analysis to beta docs. So Tess McCabe, who is part of the EIS fire team, submitted a pull request, which is now in the documentation on um, EIS, uh, on, on the fire, the fire mapping, how to map how to map fires, how to map their spread, and how to use the OGC features API. So if you have access to the Jupyter Hub, please go there now. So it's um, nasa-veda2i2c-cloud. If you open the NO2 notebook from the dashboard, the git clone step should not be necessary. But if you haven't, and I will do this with you guys, um, if you haven't, already, if you don't already have the notebook, so if you're in the NASA dash beta 2i2c cloud um, Jupyter Hub and you don't already see a directory here called beta docs, what you'll want to do is run this command, NASA, um, sorry, run this command, which is git clone command. I'm just gonna copy and paste that myself. Um, it already exists for me, so that's why I'm going to get this little error, so that's fine. And um, now what you'll want to do in order to follow along with uh, demonstrating the fire, fire tracking um, notebook is go to notebooks, tutorials, and then mapping fires. And let's see, does anybody need um, me to do that again? Raise your hand if you didn't follow all of that. Okay, so go to, if, you, if you've just opened, um, if you've just opened this link, NASA Veda 2i2c um, cloud, you're gonna go to new launcher and terminal, and then this command, git clone. And because I'm in a, now I'm cloning something into itself, but you get the point. Um, then you'd have all the beta docs. So the beta docs have now shown up for me twice, but that's cool. Um, so you'll get all the beta docs. It might take a moment. And then once you have them, you'll want to go from beta docs into notebooks, tutorials, and then mapping fires. Okay, so this notebook um, is pretty rich. It has a lot of information. Um, so one thing to point out here is that you'll, you might get this error. This is actually intentional. Um, no module named OWS lib. So 
OWS is OGC Web Services Library. So that's a, a library, a Python library we're going to use for um, loading up the features API. And so this is our features API fire in real time. And you'll see that there now I'm using this um, OWS lib library to load in the features API and see all the collections that are available. And Tess has done a really great job of talking about how you might first start by inspecting the metadata and learning more about the data set itself. Um, so she mentions how we're going to focus on the fire snapshot fire line, the fire snapshot perimeter, and the um, LF perimeter archive. So that's the large fire perimeter archive. And um, so first you might want to explore the metadata, and then you're going to, I need to actually run through these cells as well. So it all works. And um, yes, please follow along. And if you have followed along, you should be um, seeing some of these results. So uh, she filters the data to fires over five kilometers and over two days. And you can see how that's done here. And, um, and then once she has those results, we're able to load them into a GeoPandas geodata frame. So we're able to see all the data and we can explore it in a map. So if we hit df.explore, we'll see a bunch of, um, we'll see a bunch of little blue fires that have popped up here. And if you scroll over them, you get um, the actual data as well. Uh, and then you can also, she demonstrates how to integrate two different collections from the features API. So here she's integrating the fire line, the fire line um, with the perimeter data. And so by doing that, you'll see not just the fire perimeters in blue, but also the fire line. So if you scroll in here, you'll see that um, the difference between basically the fire perimeter, which is the entire um, fire area, as well as the uh, fire um, the fire line itself. Um, and then she uses this um, large fire perimeter archive, so this archive of the fire perimeters to visualize the growth of the campfire. So first um, she selects um, the bounding box in the date time for the campfire and uses this to identify the identifier for all the fires associated with that with that event. And then she maps them. Um, oops, and it's scrolling away from me here. And so here now that we have all of those um, different uh, events, all the events from the campfire in one plot, we can see basically how it grew over time. Um, another really great thing about this notebook is that it does have a lot of information about the data set. So even though we have um, the stack data catalog, um, having this type of information in our documentation provides a much richer experience, I think, for new users coming to this data set. So it talks about what each of the fields mean and what all the different tables um, consist of. Cool. All right, and now I will also break for questions. If there are some, I can look at the chat. Or if anybody had trouble following along, also let me know about that. Okay, um, well, if there are any questions later on when you go through those notebooks, obviously open, oh great, okay. How long does it typically take to develop these notebooks and examples? Ooh, good question. Um, I, <laughs> it would be interesting to have metrics on that. I think, you know, obviously doing the analysis itself is part of the documentation, but curating them for another audience that might not be familiar with the data, it does take a lot of time. Um, and how can I access the Jupyter Hub? So there, I would just say, you know, send an email to beta at uah.edu with GitHub handle. And then also I will put in, in case somebody didn't get it, um, I will also paste in the, uh, I'll also paste the, where's it now? I lost my chat. I 
And that is the link to the hub. Cool. All right. So, oops. Looks like some things got out of order here. Okay. Um, this is the Curse of the Live demo, of course. I think some things. Oh, oh, sorry. No. We're still in the scientist. I thought we were getting ready for the how it works architecture piece, but no, we still have more cool things to show. Okay, so um, custom environments. So um, one thing you might recall from running that notebook is um, that we had to install, if you notice, if you're paying cl close attention, you notice that we had to install in the notebook, the OS OWS lib library. So one thing that we wanna do is to make this a step that's unnecessary for scientists by supporting them creating custom environments. So this was just one library, but there's lots of scenarios when you have a bunch of libraries that are not part of the default um, Python environment. So for this, we've developed a system um, for developing this custom environment. So Veda Jupyter Hub Environments is a standalone repo for defining these environments and images and pushing them to AWS ECR. And then there's a library called CubeSpawner which pulls user pulls images from user input and Jupyter Hub, which has an interface. So this is um, this is a beta feature. So I'm going to um, demo this in our staging hub. So first, I need to log out actually. So this is our staging hub, and um, I already have one running. I need to actually stop it first. Curse of the live demo. Something was bound to go wrong eventually. Okay. So if I log out and I log in, I'm going to need to actually stop my server and restart it. Okay. Hub control panel. Stop my server. Okay. Okay. So when I start my server, I get, now I have some options. So these are the default options. Most mostly that what we've seen today is with the Pangeo notebook is the default option. Um, but now we have the option to specify other. And so here I can pick out. I could put any. Um, I could put any publicly available Docker image in here for this to work. Um, in theory, of course. Uh, and so when I put that in there for you can see OSW. Now it's going to start up. It's going to take a few minutes to start up, but um, yeah, basically I'm gonna just showcase how this works really quickly. So, uh, do, 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 do. okay, so now if I have a new notebook and I import, I'm gonna just make sure that this is, uh, restart the kernel, very short demo. And my library is already there. Cool, all right. Um, so scientists can contribute their data sets and discoveries to the dashboard. So we demonstrated how to contribute to the documentation, but you can also, um, it's, we also work with scientists to contribute to the dashboard. So this is the, uh, what a markdown file looks like for basically configuring content and data uh, with, the, with the UI, with the dashboard. And so now um, that that has been merged and deployed, you can see that the fire perimeters data exists in the dashboard and there's a link to the notebook. And there's also this explore data feature where we see those fire perimeters um, indicated with these uh, red markers. And yeah, try it out yourself if you wanna go to earthdata.nasa.gov dashboard data catalog. I'll just show how that works real quick. So if you go to the data catalog page, you can then search for fire and fire perimeters, so that's how you would get there. Um, however, Markdown, this Markdown format uh, syntax is hard to edit for less technical audience. So we are also working on an experimental live editor. So here is how that will work. Oh. Interesting, okay. Um, so uh, basically here you have your Markdown editor here. So it's still Markdown, but you get to see your changes in real time. So I can say, hello, I-E-G-R-S-S community. And then this moves around so you can make changes. Um, you can sort of move the editor around as you make changes. So let's say, um, yeah, this is fun. 
Cool. So that's something that's also in development. And yeah, so that is basically the data analysis portions that I wanted to demonstrate. And before we go into architecture, um, I'm going to take any questions that might have come up. So I see from Ahmed, is there any in situ data or is it all remotely sensed? Um, I, I believe at the moment we don't have any in situ data. Brian, do you, you would you agree with that? Yeah, right now everything is remote, remotely sensed. Uh, for the graphics that have the slider, can we access the actual data for the, that visualization? Yes, you should be able to have access to any of the data that you've seen. I guess, Randy, Randy, was there a specific data set that you were interested in? The MODIS data? Uh, the terrestrial water storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be available. We're not duplicating any data, so the data might be coming from um, one of the decks. I would have to double check, but we can certainly get back to you on how to access that data if it's of interest to you. Yes, please, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody could maybe mark that down as a follow-up, that'd be great. Okay, cool. So um, let's go into how it, does it all work. I'm gonna try and go through this quickly in case people have to leave at the top of the hour. Um, so we are working on an open source and reusable framework for exploiting earth observation data. So ma making massive archives of earth observation and scientific data discoverable and interoperable is a challenge many organizations face. NASA Impact and Development Seed have refined the relevant technology to a point where the true potential of these archives can be realized. The foundation of this technology, a common language for describing and discovering the data in these archives, is provided by the stack specification. We've identified a suite of stack-focused technologies that consistently work well for making massive data archives discoverable and interoperable. At its foundation, this suite stores stack in Postgres using a library called pgstack. pgstack means data discovery can exact be exactly transferable to rich visualization and data APIs, such as statistics, OGC features, and tiles for both raster and vector data. So we put data on the cloud in S3, and at the moment, most of that data is cloud-optimized geotiffs and czar, but we also have a Postgres database for those features tables. Um, as an aside, how many data sets? Um, so you might have noticed in the Stack Browser that we have 102 data sets and we do not duplicate data. Like I mentioned, we are storing and cataloging new products or in indexing existing data sets into Stack without making copies. So we cat catalog it with PG Stack. We put an API on top of it to make it discoverable. We're using the Stack Fast API library for that. We make it visualizable with a library called T Tyler PG Stack. And more importantly, we make query-driven dynamic visualizations possible. So you can visualize the data, the underlying data without having to load up all the files, but you query the database with your temporal spatial variable parameters. And that's what, what drives the tiles that are generated. And you can make it accessible via the features API with a library called TPG. And this is a set of tools we're calling EO API. So again, EO API is PG Stack, T Tyler, TPG, and Stackfest API. So these are a set of tools that can be used together or, um, or individually. Uh, and yeah, so they're basically the data system component. So these are the core data services of Veda, and you can layer layer on applications. So. In addition to the dashboard, we have our development environments, which are the Map ADE and the Jupyter Hub. So the dashboard repositories are beta UI. So beta UI is these configurable React.js components and beta config. So beta config stores all of the data set and discovery configuration. So they're markdown files which point to stack collections, items, and queries. So how does this work? Like I sort of mentioned earlier, beta UI is just React components. So these UI components, um, these JavaScript files for UI components. And that gets layered on top of beta config, which stores the actual configuration of data sets, um, data set parameters, such as spatial, temporal, extents, and variables. 
um, as well as the content itself. So the story, the sort of storytelling or the narrative about the data set itself is all stored in those markdown files. So these get bundled together and stored in S3, and then we use S3 static website hosting to host the dashboard. So in addition to the dashboard, we have these analytics interfaces. So that's the map algorithm development environment. This is an Eclipse Che multi-user remote development platform. It supports many different language programming languages and IDEs, and it's open to researchers affiliated with MAP. And then we also have the Veda Jupyter Hub, which is for more general use. We also have Compute. So we have MAP's data processing system. We have Veda's Jupyter Hub Dask system. And then we have the Open Science Gateway. Um, this is a beta platform, not accessible yet, but something that we're working on for running operational models such as ECHO. Altogether, these form the an Earth Observation Exploitation Platform. So in, addition, so in addition to all the services that we provide, obviously we um, wanna highlight also our documentation and our science support in order to make this a holistic platform that's accessible to um, new and existing users. And this is reusable in part or in whole. So we have the beta dashboard, but in addition to that, we've reused components of this for the multi-mission and algorithm and analysis platform stack catalog. The Gibbs worldview system has an instance of the dynamic tiler um, for firm, the firm's data, the firm's T-tiler. And then we're reusing pretty much all of this system for the US Greenhouse Gas Center, which is currently being worked on and should be released in July, 2023. So now my question to you all is which component do you see yourself or your organization reusing and why? Or I'll take any other questions. Well, hopefully you'll let us know if there are components that you want to reuse. Um, feel free to chime in if you if you think of them as we sort of finish up the presentation. So how you can get involved. Um, let us know if you want to try out our reusable components. So these are all of those um, in detail. So these are if you have a link to these slides, you can access the GitHub repository. So it's all open source. Um, and uh, you, we are looking into deploying VEDA into an IEEE GRSS account, um, and so this is this is something that if you're interested in, you can follow up with Manil. Um, yeah. And how can you get involved? So if you're a student or a scientist, you can get access to the VEDA Jupyter Hub, contribute to documentation, contribute a science story. Program managers and project leads can redeploy the VEDA stack of tools for application-specific science projects. And if you try and need help to redeploying any specific con component, we want to help this help us scale the impact of this project and join the community through open source contributions. So if you have any issues, please open an issue in one of our GitHub repos. All right, so thank you for your time. Um, we do have another half an hour block, so I'd be happy to have more questions or discussion. I can also walk through how data ingestion works if that's of interest to anybody that's um, that's with us. All the linked repos are, um, I would say, most of them are managed by Veda. So Daniel Stunt. Santalon, Santalon, sorry if I'm saying this, um, pronouncing that. Um, there are a number, let's go back here actually and see. So there are a number that are managed, um, that are currently in the development seed organization. A few that are in NASA Impact, I would say those are the ones that are sort of like official beta repositories. And then you'll see a few of these have more broader community adoption already by being in the Stack Utils organization. Um, another question is, does it support, uh, is it supportive for forest 
disturbances analysis. Ooh, um, I'm not familiar with forest disturbances analysis. I don't know if Brian or Manil, you can speak to that or like what data we have to support that type of research. Hi. Sorry, what was that? May, yeah, may I ask the question? Yes. On that please. forest disturbances. Yep. That means the forest change analysis, you know that. Forest land cover uh, type, change mm -hmm. in the land cover type. Mm -hmm. That uh, this model can be used for that. Um, I'm not sure. So let me just bring up the dashboard for a second. Now, if you go to the data catalog page, okay. you can search for different things, right? So we can see okay. right now, it doesn't look like we have any data sets that are specific to forest um, no. at the moment, but that would be something if it's of interest I, to you, I'd definitely be interested to know if that's a story that we should be developing together. I have seen there the catalog of the Bangladesh land cover. I have seen it. We can use that data, I think. The MODIS data? Yeah, this yeah. Uh, Sentinel data. We can also use the Sentinel data. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so all that data um, should be available through Earth data as well. And that's kind of like one thing that we're exploring is how to better incorporate. One thing we're exploring yeah. as a team is how to better incorporate um, all of NASA's archives, right? Because we don't want to duplicate data, right? So we might want to catalog it in a way that makes it more um, discoverable on our platform without mm -hmm. duplicating the data itself. Because yes, obviously that that forest, um, that land cover type, land cover mapping data does exist in the NASA Earth Data Catalog overall. Okay. <laughs> Amy, you may want to clarify that uh, what's shown in the dashboard in terms of data sets is not a full list of data sets that's available in the system. Oh, yes. Good point. That is a very good point. Yeah. And um, so basically, these data sets um, are ones that have been cataloged via VEDA, the VEDA configuration. So like I was mentioning earlier, there's this uh, VEDA config um, this beta config repository that includes all of the, uh, sorry, let me just go back here. Um, so that would include all the data sets that have been, that are showing up. This includes all the data sets that are showing up. Um, but if you want the full catalog, you would go to that, um, actually I'll go there through the documentation. So if you wanna see all of the data sets that are available, the probably the best way to do that is through the stack browser. Um, and then there's also some documentation about um, how to use the PyStack client to interact with that data. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, disaster vulnerability data. I know that we have, so we have some interesting um, blue tarp detection data. Um, that I haven't explored for a while, but let's go see what that looks like. So if you go to the stack browser and tarp. So um, this is some interesting uh, research done with impact as well on detecting blue tarps after hurricane events um, to sort of identify where there'd been the most um, disaster impact in those regions. I'm not familiar with any other disaster recovery data sets that we have. Um, Brian, do you know of any others that might be relevant? Yeah, I mean, I think what I'll say first in terms of the data is that a lot of the data that we have in the catalog and that we have visualized has been kind of directed. So we've gone toward initiatives from environmental justice or the Earth Information Science, uh, sorry, Earth Information System Science teams. Uh, that have contributed a lot of this data. And so like Amy mentioned, we're working on getting the data from the NASA archives cataloged into the bucket to kind of provide more increased functionality. Um, I will say too that the Jupyter Hub has direct access to a number of different buckets within the NASA archives. So even though we may not have it cataloged, 
you can still access that data. Um, an example of that is HLS. So if you're if you're familiar with the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 data products, if you're to you know if you are currently in the, the Jupyter Hub, you should be able to access those S3 URLs directly. Um, since we don't have those indexed currently, you would have to get those URLs from uh, Earth Data Search Client. Um, and then you should be able to access those files. Uh, we have a couple of notebook examples that show that, and we can share those examples um, in the chat. But in terms of other data, I think that's you know one of the main themes I'm seeing is what data do you have in there? I would just say that right now a lot of the data is targeted because we've kind of been directed to get data in um, to kind of start populating some of the different contents, test out the different components of data. And now we're working on kind of scaling the data that's available from the platform. And so even though there may not be data necessarily from forest disturbances yet, that's something that I would expect to be uh, in the platform uh, soon. Cool. Rachel Connolly asks, are there any new communication story map tools or functionality like the slider that are in the development pipeline and will be coming later? I think the big one that comes to mind is like the in integration with Zenodo and the Markdown editor. Those are the two big ones that I'm aware of. Brian, are there others that you're aware of? Yeah, I think the main one for generating um, discoveries is gonna be that Markdown editor. And so a lot of the different content that you see uh, within the discoveries, whether it be scrolly telling, where you can kind of highlight a particular area and provide a card on the side to detail it, or comparison sliders. A lot of that is just uh, configured within a markdown file. Um, and so I think having that markdown editor on top of the discovery uh, generation is gonna really make that easier. Yeah, sorry about that. I think we had a little technical issue. Okay, so I think, Amy, I was answering a question about, um, what was I answering? New about? features, it was new, yeah, new features of the, that are coming for um, data, like storytelling. Right, so yeah, I think that was, I think I pretty much closed the loop on what was coming in terms of the markdown files. Amy also mentioned something about Zenodo, and so I will at least mention that we've started up a Zenodo community for VEDA. So beyond the workshop, what I would say is if you want to keep up with some of the stuff that we've done as part of VEDA, um, let me post the link in here. We will be putting our content, like these presentations that we're doing, uh, the GitHub repository that we use uh, for uh, the, the workshop, all of that is gonna be within uh, the VEDA community. And so when I paste that link in there, um, there's currently nothing in there, but we will be able to, or you should be able to follow along with some of the content that we're creating on top of that, uh, using that Zenodo community. And then things like the discoveries that we publish, uh, those will have DOIs within the Zenodo um, page. We're working on notebooks and getting DOIs for the notebooks that are published, um, just so that we have some kind of uh, way to credit the people who are contributing those resources to the community. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, was there, were there any other questions I'm trying to, I might've missed some at the bottom, unfortunately. So maybe recall if there are other questions we need to address. Hi, uh, so I had a question. Yeah. So I like to know uh, if the data like nitrogen oxide, the light, uh, night light data, all of these data are available for India also, or is it regional specific? Oh, right, yes. Um, so let's see, the night lights data, what I was going to demonstrate was how to um, how to find out. So now again, if you are move, okay. So if you're on the dashboard, you can see which data sets are available on the dashboard through this tool, like I demonstrated, and you can select this area and see 
you know, um, for this in like some temporal range, um, which is like 2001 to 2020, you might be able to see what data sets are available um, this way. However, like um, Manil mentioned, this wouldn't necessarily be everything. So you can also go to the, um, the browser, which I think I had up somewhere, but let me just bring it up. Um, oops, sorry. So here we have the night lights data. I don't believe, let's see, Black Marbit, it looks like there's a few different ones um, that are available. And this should show where it is um, available. So it doesn't look like, at least in this first page, and you'd have to scroll through. So this is like kind of, oh, so if you go back here, you see there probably is a little bit in, um, so this is sort of uh, one way of seeing what data is available for spatial or temporal extent. The best way, the most complete way would be to um, now use the documentation, I hope will be helpful in this um, a little bit. So if you list the stack collections, it should also give you some instructions about how to, um, there should be some examples in here about how to basically filter the data based on a spatial and temporal extent. So some of these examples in here, these tutorials, um, I'm trying to think of what might be a good one. So um, let's see, I think the NO2 one might be a good one. So you'd basically want to uh, declare your collection an area of interest, and then you'd be able to sort of figure out if the nightlights data is available for that, for that spatial extent. So hopefully that helps. Cool, thank you. I think before we got kicked out, I'd also posted some links. Um, we are actively deploying the VEDA stack into an AWS account for IEEE GRSS members to play around with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and repost the, those links. Um, and I don't know if Amy, you want to go through them, but, or at least maybe click on one of them. On one of the re GitHub repositories? Oh, right. oh so yeah. yeah. One of the links that we have for the IEEE deployment of VEDA. Oh, nice. Okay. So, so that we users can, have... can kind of explore in there too. Nice. Cool, so it looks like there's already some Sentinel data in here. Nice. Anything else you wanted me to highlight here, Brian? No, I think it's just for awareness uh, for the team. So as you, you know, I think a lot of questions were around what data do we have? I think this will be another area where maybe we start getting data that's available within say AWS Open Data Registry. That's where that Sentinel uh, 2 level 2A data is coming from. We plan to continue to add more data here as well. Um, but then that's another way that you can kind of come in and explore the different data sets that we have uh, or that we're trying to integrate. And so this is kind of another Pathfinder uh, deployment that we're trying to use for the overall production data system. Cool. Yeah, and I guess it's worth mentioning, like we did all this was deployed in a matter of days, right? Like it was pretty quick. That's right. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we've tried to focus on with VEDA here. And we've, I think Amy's touched on that a little bit is that if you wanted to be able to deploy something like the resources that we've de developed as part of the VEDA stack, you should be able to take it as is, deploy it, um, and then build any kind of extensions upon it that you, know, you may need for your specific application. Uh, deploying the core services is, is fairly straightforward as we've done uh, both with the IEEE deployment uh, of data stack and we're also doing it for our uh, greenhouse gas center data information system. Nice. Cool. Well, I'm glad so many people rejoined. <laughs> I wish we hadn't been cut off, but you know, these things happen. Um, leaving, on, leaving it on a cliffhanger for some folks, I guess. 
All right. Um, Priscilla asks, ooh, MIT Media Lab, very cool. I had a, a prior professor from the MIT Media Lab who was awesome. I was interested in engaging with the Markdown and Beta Interactive Dashboard Notebooks. If I need help, help. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, you're probably sick of me hearing hearing me say this, but I would just email Veda, um, you know, Veda uah.edu if you're having any issues. If you have any issues, you can certainly email us. Um, if you're using the notebooks, if you're using the notebooks here, you will also notice that there is a link to the repository home. Um, and if you go here, another great way to let us know about any issues or questions is you can open an issue here. There, one other way is that within the dashboard itself, there's a feedback form. So I don't know, Amy, if oh, you yeah. saw the dashboard open. Yep. So there's multiple um, ways to get in touch with us. Um, yeah. if, you're, if you're exploring in the dashboard and you find a bug, you can hit feedback, send it, and then we'll be able to handle it from there. If you're doing something that's more technical and you want to send it through a GitHub issue, I think you're welcome to do that. If it's just for general access to the Veda Hub, um, I think Veda at UHIEDU is a perfect place uh, to send that information. Um, and then I don't know if you're getting to the specific interactive markdown editor. I think that's something that's coming up in a future deployment. Uh, so it's not actually in production yet. That's coming soon. And I think, you know, if you follow along, we'll be able to kind of keep track of of one that's actually into the production system. Are there any final questions or? All right. Um, if not, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, First, I just wanted to make you guys aware that the recording will be available at the GRSS YouTube channel. I think I linked that previously. I think we can go ahead and link that again here um, in the chat. Uh, the hub, we plan to remain uh, or leave the hub open. So if you have access to the hub already, um, you should be able to continue to play around and interact with the different data, interact with the capabilities within the uh, the beta system for the next couple of weeks. Um, if you do have feedback or questions about that, again, I think we've given you guys ways to communicate back to us. If you did not get hub access during the, the presentation, uh, please again, send your GitHub handle to beta at uah.edu and we can get you access for that. Um, I think we've talked about, you know, different ways to contact us. I'm not gonna to belabor the point Veda at uh.edu, the feedback button in the dashboard if you find something as you're exploring within the dashboard page. And then we also have GitHub issues if you're looking at something that maybe is a bit more technical. Um, and then lastly, I, I just want to thank Amy for the presentation. Uh, I think a lot of work went into this and getting everything set up. And so Amy, thank you for your time today. I want to thank you all for joining and then rejoining again after we had the technical issues. Um, and then I'd like to thank GRSS, uh, the uh, ESI Technical Committee, and then Farouz for co coordinating the, rep, uh, the webinar. Um, unless there are any other questions, I think we're ready to kind of close this out. And I thank you all for your time. Thanks, guys.